This is the second video covering material from section 3.1.1.3 in AQA A-Level Chemistry. If you haven't already watched the video about electron arrangement, you need to watch that one first before you come on to this one. Before we can talk about ionisation energy, it's really important that you're very confident with how to work out the electron arrangement or electron configuration of a particular element. So just quickly pause the video and write down what the electron arrangement of each one of these elements is. Hopefully you've managed to work out that hydrogen should be 1s1, helium will be 1s2, lithium will be 1s2, 2s1, oxygen will be 1s2, 2s2, 2p4 to make eight electrons in total. Sodium will be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. And sulfur will be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4, making 16 electrons in total. To describe ionisation energies, you need to know what ionisation is. So hopefully you know from GCSE that ionisation is the creation of charged particles when atoms either gain or lose electrons. And we know that electrons are negative, so if an atom like this sodium atom here loses an electron, it will create an ion with a positive charge. And likewise, if a non-metal atom gains some electrons, then that will create a negatively charged ion. So here's our definition. The first ionisation energy of a particular element is the amount of energy that's required to take one electron away from every atom in a mole of gaseous atoms to make one mole of gaseous ions that have a single positive charge. Now, two things to be aware of here. One is that it's always a gas. It doesn't matter what the element is. So for the example here, we're using iron. You know that at room temperature, iron is a solid, but it doesn't matter. The definition is always for it as a gas. And so if you get a question that asks you to write one of these equations, it's really, really important that you put the state symbols in to show that you know that it's a gas. The other thing is we're not interested in what the right type of iron to make is. So iron would typically make ions with a two plus or a three plus charge. That doesn't matter. The first ionization energy is always about the removal of the first electron. This is a really common one mark question asking you to write an equation which shows the process described by the first ionisation energy of a particular element. So we start off here with sodium and we're going to have one mole of sodium and we put that state symbol in to show it's a gas and it's breaking apart to make sodium ions with a single positive charge which are also gaseous and electrons. You don't need a state symbol on the electron, you just leave it off. Then we've got calcium and likewise one mole of calcium breaking apart to make one mole of cations with a single positive charge and an electron. Like we said, it doesn't matter that calcium should, in inverted commas, make two plus ions. We're just interested in the first ionisation energy, and that's about the removal of the first electron. And then finally, we've got rubidium. Same thing. We start off with gaseous atoms and they're split apart to make gaseous ions with a single positive charge and an electron for every atom. There aren't just first ionisation energies, though. There's second and third and there are as many ionisation energies as you have electrons in an atom. But the crucial thing is that each ionisation energy is only describing the removal of one electron per atom. So if you look at this first example, the second ionisation energy of magnesium, that's not about the amount of energy it takes to take off both of those electrons. It's about the amount of energy it takes to remove the second one. The first one's already gone. So you can see here we've got a mole of magnesium ions with a single positive charge, and then we're removing from each one of those atoms one electron so that we have a mole of magnesium ions with a two plus charge. And then likewise, you can see below here, we've got the third ionization energy of oxygen. And so we've got O2 plus ions and we're removing from each one of those one electron so that we get our O3 plus ions. And you can see that for both of these, again, we've got these gaseous state symbols because it's really important that this is always referring to happening in a gas. Now, it's also crucial that you recognise that an ionisation energy is always about the loss of electrons. So it doesn't matter that you know as a chemist that oxygen typically forms O2 minus ions. When we're talking about ionisation energies, we're always talking about the loss of electrons. So here are a couple more questions, only this time we're looking at um, ionisation energies other than the first one. So just pause here and double check that you've got the hang of it. 
So first up, we have manganese Mn, and we're interested in the third ionization energy. So that's the loss of the third electron. So we're starting off with an Mn2 plus ion, and again, it's gaseous, and it's losing an electron to make an Mn3 plus ion. Then for aluminium, we're starting off with Al plus and we're losing an electron to make Al2 plus because it's the second ionization energy. So it's really, really important. We're only losing one electron at a time. So for any element you're interested in, you can look up in a data table what the first ionization energy is and the second and the third and the fourth and all the way through. Those ionization energies are always going to get bigger. And the reason for that is that as you're removing those electrons, the ion is getting more and more positively charged. So you start off and you're removing an electron from something that's neutral, which is doable. And then gradually you're removing it from something that's positive and more positive and more positive. And so there's stronger and stronger attraction holding those electrons in and it's harder and harder to remove them. So ionization energies are always going to be going up. However, they're not always going to go up by the same amount. And the size of the jump from one ionization energy to the next tells you something about shells. So here's a little graph I made about the ionization energies of aluminium. So you can see first one very low, second one slightly higher, third one slightly higher. There's a big jump from the third ionization energy to the fourth. Now, if you just think practically for a second, you know that aluminium is in group three and it has three electrons in its outer shell. The final one is in the 3p subshell and then the two that come before it are in the 3s subshell. Once you've taken out those three electrons, which are in that third shell, you're then having to remove electrons from the second shell, which is closer to the nucleus. And therefore, the electrons in that closer shell are experiencing more attraction. So it's harder to remove them. So quite often you'll have exam questions that will give you data like this and they'll ask you either to identify which set of data belongs to a particular element or to identify what an element is. And what you're always looking for is this big jump and the big jump tells you where you started a new shell. So here's an example of an exam question which gives us three sets of data and asks us to identify which element is calcium you know that calcium is in group two of the periodic table. And therefore, you can remove two electrons comparatively easily, but to take a third one out is going to take a lot more energy because we're going to be going into a new shell. So you're looking for a piece of data that shows us a big jump between the second ionization energy and the third. So we can see right here, if we compare X, Y, and Z, there's a much bigger jump for Y between the second and third ionization energies than there is for X or for Z. And so that tells us that this element must be in group two. So given that our options to pick from a calcium in group two and scandium and vanadium, which are not, we know that this one must be calcium. Here's a question testing the same kind of knowledge, but with a slightly different approach. So here we're told that this particular element is in group three and we have to identify what it is. We're not given options to pick from. So what I'm immediately looking for is, are there two ionization energies next to each other where there's suddenly a big jump? So as I go through one, two, three, four, they're all sort of going up by about the same amount. When I get to six to seven, I can see that there's a sudden dramatic increase. So what that tells me is that energetically speaking, removing the first six electrons was quite straightforward, but removing the seventh was much more challenging. And that's because it's being taken out of a new shell that's much closer to the nucleus and experiencing much more attraction. So this tells me that my element must be in group six. And therefore, if it's in group six and it's in period three, it must be sulfur. Finally, here's a prose question testing the same idea. So we need to explain why the second ionization energy of calcium is lower than the second ionization energy of potassium. So why does it take less energy to remove a second electron from calcium than it does to remove a second electron from potassium? So if you think about where these are in the periodic table, they're in group one and group two. So for potassium, that first electron comes out of the S subshell. And the second electron is going to come out of the 3p subshell. Whereas for calcium, they're both coming out of the 4s subshell. So when calcium positive iron loses an electron, it does so from the 4s orbital. And this is higher energy. Okay, It's further away from the nucleus and the electrons there have more energy. Also, 
Because calcium has more shells, the electron is experiencing more shielding. Those inner electrons are sort of protecting the outer shell electron from the attraction from the nucleus, and therefore it's easier to overcome that attraction. You need to be able to describe and explain how first ionisation energies change as you go across a period or down a group. So we'll start with periods. Here we've got period three from sodium to argon. So as you go from sodium to argon, generally speaking, the trend is that the first ionisation energy increases. It gets steadily harder and harder to remove an electron from each of those atoms. Now, the main reason for this is that the nuclear charge is increasing. So sodium has 11 protons, magnesium has 12, aluminium has 13, and each one of those protons is exerting a positive charge. And that gives an electrostatic force of attraction between those protons and the electrons. Now, you might think, well, the number of electrons is increasing as well, and it is. But what you have to remember is that those electrons aren't collectively experiencing this force of attraction. They're individually experiencing it. So that one electron that's in the outer shell is feeling 11 protons worth of pull or 12 or 13. And it doesn't really matter if there are other electrons in that shell with it. It's still feeling that pull. So as we go across the period from left to right, we're going to see a general increase in first ionisation energy because of the increased nuclear charge. Here you're asked to describe and explain the trend in first ionisation energy across period three. So the first thing we need to say is that it generally increases from left to right. Then we need to explain that this is because as we go from left to right, the elements have a greater nuclear charge because they have more protons. And that's important because it means that there's a stronger attraction between the nucleus and the outer shell electrons. So that's three of the four marks. The fourth one's coming up in a minute. So as we go across the period, the most important thing is the increase in nuclear charge. But as we go down a group, there are actually two other things that are more important. And the latter of these is the fourth mark to that exam question we just looked at. So firstly, as you go down a group, the atoms are getting bigger. You know, if you could take out a ruler and measure them, they're literally getting wider. And so that means that the electrons are actually further away from the nucleus. And so therefore, they're experiencing slightly less nuclear attraction because they're just further away. The other thing is that the reason they're getting further away is not just that the shells are expanding, it's that the atom is gaining more shells. So your outer shell electrons are feeling less of the attraction from that nucleus because the inner shell electrons are sort of standing in the way. And we call that phenomenon shielding. Now, if you're looking at elements that are in the same period, they all have the same number of shells, so they're not experiencing the shielding. But we do still need to mention it in the question. So here we're just going to say that they experience the same shielding because their outer shell electrons are in the same shell, and therefore that's not affecting it. And that's why the atomic charge is the most important thing. So here's a couple more exam questions just to check you've understood what we're talking about. So here we asked to state why the first ionisation energy of rubidium is lower than the first ionisation energy of sodium. Now, this is a one mark question and we're being asked for one answer, but there are actually lots of things that could get you credit here. We could say that rubidium is a bigger atom. We could say that the electrons are further away from the nucleus because it's a bigger atom. Um, we could say that the electron is being lost from a higher energy level because it has more shells. Uh, we could say there's more shielding because it has more shells. Uh, we could say that there's less attraction of the nucleus to the outer shell electron. Or we could just say it has more shells. So here, rather than just explaining data, we're being asked to state and explain the trend. So the trend is that as you go down the group, the first ionisation energy gets smaller. As you go down the group, it gets easier to remove an electron. And the reason for this is because the atoms have got bigger, because they have more shells, um, and therefore the electrons are experiencing weaker attraction to the nucleus. But that's not the whole story. So, so far we've talked about a general trend across the period, but actually it's not a perfect upward line. If you look at the first ionization energies of period three, you'll see that when we get to aluminium and when we get to sulfur, there's a sudden drop. It suddenly gets easier for some reason to take that first electron out. So these are actually two quite separate scenarios with different explanations. For aluminium, it's all about where that outer shell electron is coming from. So we said when we looked at group one or group two that it was easier to remove an electron from the larger atoms because that electron was geographically further away from the nucleus and therefore it was experiencing less attraction. Now, that's also true when we're looking at aluminium. 
it hasn't started a new shell, but its outer shell electron is in the 3p orbital rather than the 3s orbital where magnesium had its outer shell electron. And that 3p orbital is higher in energy, it's further away from the nucleus, and therefore that electron is experiencing less attraction and is easier to remove. Now sulphur is quite a different situation. The difference for sulphur isn't that we're starting a new shell or a new subshell, it's that we finally started pairing those electrons in those orbitals. So if you remember when we talked about orbitals, we said that when you got to the 2p or the 3p subshell, you would put one electron in each of the three orbitals, and then when you got to the fourth p block element, you would go back and start pairing those electrons. And that's exactly what happens with sulphur. The thing is, those paired electrons are repelling each other because they're both negative, and therefore it's easier to remove an electron that's been paired than an electron that hasn't, because there's another electron already kind of trying to force it out of that space. So ionisation energies are pretty important because they provide us with evidence for the fact that shells and subshells do actually exist. In terms of shells, we've looked at the fact that you have a dramatically larger ionisation energy every time that you remove an electron from a full shell. And the reason for that is that when you get to that particular ionisation energy, you're trying to remove an electron that's that much closer to the nucleus and also is experiencing less shielding because there's one fewer shell in the way between it and the nucleus. And also the fact that we have decreasing first ionisation energies as we go down a group. So each time that you add a shell, it becomes comparatively less energetic difficult to remove an electron. And then in terms of subshells, it's that thing we saw with aluminium, where you have a smaller first ionisation energy for elements that have their outermost electron in a new subshell, because that means that we're removing an electron from a subshell that's further away from the nucleus, and that takes less energy. So in this video, we've defined first ionisation energies, we've written equations for the first and also successive ionisation energies, we've mentioned how super important it is that you remember that they have to be gaseous, and also that you're only ever removing one electron at a time, and we've looked at how those ionisation energies vary across a period and down a group, and how that provides evidence for the existence of shells and subshells. I hope this was useful, don't forget to subscribe!